Dr. Kalani, I think if you wanted to get started, I think we're right at noon and I'm sure you know people will slowly trickle in, but I think it's probably probably good to start if you would like. Okay. Oh no, I'd be more than happy to. <laughs> um, so good afternoon and welcome to the John Butler Memorial Lecture. Um, before I introduce this year's uh, lecture, I'd like to provide a little background on who John Butler was and why we have this memorial lecture for him. John Butler, or JB as everyone knew him, began his medical education at the University of Birmingham in England where he focused on lung mechanics. He spent one year in Arthur Bois lab in Philadelphia and was later invited to the Cardiovascular Research Institute at the University of California with Julius Conroe. JB was recruited to build the Division of Respiratory Diseases at the University of Washington in 1965. He had a vision for this new subspecialty that included scientific research, clinical excellence, and he deserves uh, a great deal of credit for the division and who we are today. I had the great fortune of knowing JB. He was a true English gentleman, very kind, thoughtful, and above all, a very creative scientist. Uh, you can read more about him in the brochure that you can find in the chat. You can also see from the brochure that we've had a long list of prior lecturers. Each year, we have a committee that gets together to identify an individual who is an international leader, has a broad interest in pulmonary and critical care medicine, and a deep commitment to working with young investigators. We are very fortunate this year to have Jeremy Kahn as this year's lecturer. And Jeremy really embodies many of JB's leadership qualities and the commitment to mentoring uh, young scientists. You can read about Jeremy in the brochure as well, but just as a way of a brief introduction, uh, Jeremy began his education at the University of Virginia medical school and then moved west to the University of Chicago for his residency training, and then even further west to be in our program for pulmonary and critical care fellowship. As a fellow, Jeremy authored a first author, a New England Journal publication on the associations between hospital volume and outcomes from mechanical ventilation and was really just an early indicator that Jeremy was gonna be very successful. He took his first faculty position at the University of Pennsylvania, but then was shortly recruited to the University of Pittsburgh where he remains today, climbing through the faculty ranks and leadership positions to now be a professor of critical care medicine and health policy and management. He has garnered numerous awards, including membership in the ASCI and multiple presidential citations from the Society of Critical Care Medicine. His research is well-funded through multiple grants, including an outstanding investigator award from NIH that provides six years of protected time and six and a half million dollars to conduct his research. He is the director of the University of Pittsburgh's training program in critical care outcomes and has a very long list of successful mentees. He has over 250 publications. So please uh, join me in welcoming uh, this year's John Butler Memorial Lecturer, uh, Dr. Jeremy Kahn. Rob, thank you so much for that amazing introduction. Um, I am gonna share my screen and why I'm doing that, say what an unbelievable treat and, and honor this is. Um, I have a couple um, housekeeping slides and then a little bit of time in which I will ask you to indulge me as I uh, uh, wax nostalgic, if you will, about my time in Seattle, and then we'll get to the talk. Um, here's the disclosure slide um, that they asked me to put up. There's nothing too super exciting there. Uh, here's the first part of uh, what I'll call Please Indulge Me. So the person on the left is Art Slutsky. Art Slutsky was the person who gave the Butler lecture when I was a first year fellow in Seattle uh, way back in 2002, 2003. And I vividly remember that day. And if you're not in pulmonary critical care, you may not know Art, but he's truly a giant in the field. And it was an awe inspiring day for me seeing him visit Seattle and lecture. 
And the, the thought that I'm now of this stature is honestly a bit mystifying and a bit wonderful and mostly humbling and really, really great. Um, so thank you so much. It's really an honor to be here. The person on the right, of course, is John Butler. And I never met John. He died uh, uh, 10 years before I came to Seattle. But in some very, very real and literal ways, I feel like I am an heir to his legacy, which really makes it such a pleasure to be giving this talk. Here, here's a picture from 1986 that Dave Pearson was kind enough to share with me. And there's a lot of unfortunate attire here and some unfortunate facial hair. Th this was the year of my bar mitzvah, by the way. So I'm, I'm, uh, if you saw a picture of me, I think I'd be even more ashamed than these people. But looking at these, this picture, you can really see what, what JB created um, as our inaugural division chief. And there's so many people on this uh, slide. I'm not going to call all of them out by name, but you know Tom Martin and Moira and Dave Pearson, um, uh, Dave Ralph, all these people who had such an amazing impact on my career. I don't even know if all of them know the impact they had on my career. I, I, I remember vividly when I was a fellow rotini at the VA um, and Tom Martin called me into his office and he had never met me and he does not do my kind of research. Uh, he's a basic scientist and I a, was a health services researcher or a health services researcher in training. And he sat me down and said, Jeremy, tell me about yourself. And we spoke for an hour and he gave me advice that I still use to this day. And that's what was so wonderful about what JB created. Um, there is a culture of collegiality uh, in Seattle that was so wonderful and instrumental, this, this culture of uh, academic inquiry and the notion that research is so tightly tied with the clinical enterprise. And then the uh, most important thing, which is the culture of mentorship, which is just so amazing. And the number of people who that culture has touched is really outstanding. Um, th this slide really shows the direct line you can draw between JB and how I got to be where I am. JB obviously helped recruit Len Hudson. Len Hudson was the whole reason I went to Seattle. Um, uh, when I told my mentors in residency that I wanted to train in clinical epidemiology and critical care, they said, there's only one place you should go. You have to go to Seattle and train with Len. And that was the greatest decision I ever made. Uh, Len introduced me to Gordon Rubenfeld. Uh, you cannot overstate the influence that Gordon had on my career. And so there really is just this very bright line between JB and me. And as, as I was putting these slides, th this thing is what was really cool to me and a little bit scary also, which is, you know, JB had the, one of the first T32s offered by the NIH established in 1978. He was the first PI. And then when Len was PI, I was a trainee on that grant. Now I'm the PI of a T32, which is horribly frightening and really, really scary. And don't tell the NIH, I don't think they realize it yet. But the fact that I was on JB and Lens T32, and now I'm a T32 director, just shows that this legacy lives on, right? And, it, and the line doesn't end here. There's also all the people that I've mentored. There's all the people who are on my T32 that are being trained. And that's really what it's about. And it's really why it makes this talk so special uh, for me. So thank you. Okay, uh, enough memory lane. Let's talk about uh, science. There's still gonna be a little bit more narrative, but, um, but here's to the talk. So here's a bit of an outline. Uh, I'm gonna give a background on ICU teamwork. Um, I'm gonna show you some new empirical work that we're working on, two studies, one of which was just published and one of which is soon to be published. And then I'm gonna be showing you a clinical trial that we have just launched. There, uh, we literally launched it last week. There was no new data, but it'll be hopefully a nice narrative about how I took a bit of a shift uh, midway through my career, started a new line of inquiry that has really borne exciting fruit and revealed hopefully something that we can use to improve the quality of care in the ICU. Okay. Background. So it starts when I was a resident, University of Chicago Hospital. Um, on the right is a textbook. Um, a textbook, we may have some residents or medical students who might not know what a textbook is. It's a book that contains medical knowledge. You could probably Google it and find that out. But suffice it to say, this book was hugely influential. It, we called it Hall, Schmidt, and Wood. And Jesse Hall, Greg Schmidt, and Larry Wood were on faculty at University of Chicago. And these people ruled the world. I wanted to be like them so badly, so smart, so able to apply physiology. 
such great clinicians and also such great investigators. And even just seeing them walk the halls is when I knew that I wanted to be a intensivist. Um, and then it got even more exciting because when I was a resident, this study came out. So uh, that's J.P. Kress on the left. He was the first author. There's Jesse Hall on the right, one of the Hall, Schmidt and Wood authors. He was the senior author. And I, I won't get into the details of this study because it's not super relevant to the talk, but suffice it to say, this was a hugely influential study in critical care, maybe one of the most influential in the last 25 years. What they did is they determined that when we sedate critically ill patients in the ICU, we should largely use a light touch. We don't want to put them all the way under. We want to keep them awake using a variety of techniques, and we're going to achieve better, more patient-centered outcomes if we do so. And this was really a transformative study in the field. And what was really transformative for me was the date this was published, May 18th, 2000. So I was an intern in the MICU at University of Chicago when this study was uh, published. And man, I was hot for this study. I, I could I was so excited to see these people that I worshiped and idolized really doing fantastic transformative work um, that we were gonna use in practice. And then I hope I'm not embarrassing anyone and I'm pretty confident Jesse Hall and JP are not on this talk, but I showed up in the ICU so excited to, to interrupt the sedative effusion in my ICU patients only to find, oh, we're not really doing that in our ICU yet. And when I explored a little more, it was because it was really hard to wake patients up. Uh, it required a really strong coordinated effort between the nurse and the respiratory therapist and the clinicians. And there was a lot of resistance for a variety of factors. And not that I was disappointed per se, but I was sort of wise to the challenge, right? The challenge of translating evidence into practice. And that was the second main lesson I learned and really was the focus of my career was one, I knew I wanted to be intensivist. And then I knew that I wanted to focus my career on the translation of evidence into practice. Also, when I was a resident, this came out when I was a second year resident, uh, a really landmark publication that most of you probably know, uh, Crossing the Pirality Chasm which was put out by the Institute of Medicine that really for the first time called attention to this collective failure to reliably translate clinical evidence into routine practice. And I wanted to be part of the solution. I didn't want to simply generate new evidence, but I wanted to figure out how do we take that new evidence and rapidly and efficiently translate it into practice in a way that improved the quality of care. And I came to Seattle to work with Len and Gordon to work specifically on this problem. I, I knew at the time that I wanted to take a kind of broad sociologic approach to it. And I knew of this framework. Uh, this is a really valuable framework, if you're not aware of it, by Donna Bedian. He was at the University of Michigan. He was a social psychologist. And he defined um, healthcare quality for the first time. This was way back in 1978, this publication was from Science. And what he says is we can define healthcare quality along three domains, structure, process, and outcome. Uh, the outcome of care is the degree to which healthcare delivers um, outcomes that are important to patients and society. The process of care is the degree to, to which care aligns with best practices. And the structure of care is how healthcare is organized and managed to best deliver the other two domains. And this slide more than any other um, typifies or, or uh, demonstrates what my career has been about. I've really tried to study the structure of critical care and how we can organize and manage the ICU to best deliver evidence-based practice and save lives. And I've taken a really broad sort of socioeconomic uh, technological uh, slant to thinking about structure and in doing so I've defined it pretty broadly. And this is sort of what I've been doing since fellowship. This is the last you know, 15, 20 years of my life. We studied intensivist staffing and nurse staffing and how to get intensivists and nurses um, on the same page. We've studied interprofessional rounds and provided some evidence that shows that a day, an interprofessional team should be rounding every day in the ICU. We've studied ICU telemedicine as a technological approach to translating evidence into practice. We've looked at protocols and checklists. And then I also do a lot of policy evaluation um, in terms of how at the state and federal level, things like pay for performance and value-based purchasing um, can be used to speed translation of evidence into practice. Um, and this really was 
you know, it brought the grants in, it got the papers, it was really rewarding, and it was really quite pleasurable to me. But looking at this list, I was always thinking back to those days in the medical ICU at the University of Chicago and thinking about the lift of getting um, people to receive evidence-based sedation practices. And there was always something missing um, about my research and about what I was studying. And it was just this notion of the team itself, not who is there, meaning should we have a pharmacist and a respiratory therapist and a uh, intensivist physician and not what they were doing, but how was the team itself working together? How can we improve the process and outcomes of critical care by just making those individuals work together better as a team? Um, one of the reasons I had never studied this is because others have studied it and they found answers that were really depressing. And I'm just gonna walk you through a little bit of the literature. There's obviously a ton of work that's been done in this field, but I, I, and I'm not gonna hit all the highlights, but this paper was really influential. It was long before I entered critical care. There were some really heavy hitters on this paper. Jack Zimmerman and Bill Knaus were the developers of the Apache system and uh, which is something that we use you know, every day. Steve Shortell is now the Dean of Public Health at Berkeley. Uh, Denise Rousseau is truly a legend in the field of, of healthcare organization and management. And this was an ARC funded study that spent a long time developing a measure of ICU teamwork and trying to establish a link between how we manage the ICU and how, um, and how patients fare and clinical outcomes. And because these are largely health economists they present data in ways that are impossible to understand. But suffice it to say, it was, it was bupkis. It was nothing. I, I highlighted the main risk estimate and the beta. And even when I was a fellow and I wanted to get into this, I called up Steve Shortell and asked him to reflect on this. And he basically told me, don't study teamwork <laughs> because he was very depressed about how much time and effort he had put into this study only for uh, to find a negative result. And that was one of the reasons that I started looking at these harder, more measurable structural outcomes. Uh, many years later, other people have tried to do this. Dave Huang here at Pitt did a study um, where they also surveyed a bunch of ICUs. They used something called the safety and attitudes questionnaire. This was during the patient safety era. And again, not to delve too much into this, but, um, but it was a negative study. The main risk estimates to look at there are teamwork climate and safety climate. And there was no relation between that at the level of the intensive care unit and, uh, and patient outcomes. So again, just no good evidence, uh, despite at the time our best efforts trying to figure out if there was a relationship between how the team worked and how patients ended up um, faring. Uh, here's a systematic review that says that the ICU is not the only place that has this problem. Uh, all of, everywhere in healthcare, there's actually not been good evidence that teamwork is an effective strategy to improve the quality of care. It's a nice systematic review if you want to look at it. And it's led to some really super depressing slides like this one, looking at efforts to improve that teamwork. Um, this is a systematic review that looked at things like um, team building exercises and communication and collaboration exercises, just as ways to get teams on the same page in the ICU. And every single intervention that tried to focus on the team was negative. And, you know, going over this study then, going over these studies then rather, and going over them now, I was super depressed and I'm still super depressed because I feel like there's this sort of but, right? There's this sort of like, okay, the data are all negative, but, but we feel like surely the team and the quality of the team is influential in outcome. Surely we see this every day in our practice that some days the team is really working well and we have really effective collaboration. And some days the team is working really poorly and we don't have effective collaboration. And surely this must influence how we deliver evidence-based care. And there's other reasons why this is so intuitive too, right? We think teamwork is very important in all walks of life, not just healthcare. Here's a picture of the Pittsburgh Steelers defeating the Seattle Seahawks last weekend in the NFL. And you, you may not believe this, but I literally just Google did a Google image search for sports team. And magically this came up, even though I'm live in Pittsburgh and you all are in Seattle. And you know, it's an amazing coincidence, I know, but you know, there you have it. Crazy. So all that to say that we teams have to matter, right? 
And then when we do a Google image search on ICU team, we get this, right? We get super smiley faces who are really much happier than I am when I'm in the ICU and are also probably much better looking than I am when I'm in the ICU. So the world thinks that the ICU matters. Um, and even at the birth of critical care, there's this feeling like the team mattered, right? This is Peter Saffer. Peter uh, uh, founded the first intensive care unit in the United States in Baltimore City Hospital in 1958. He later moved to the University of Pittsburgh. His main thing was resuscitation science and he was a pioneer in resuscitation. We have a research center here in my department named after him, the Saffer Center. Uh, and this was him reflecting on why he founded that first ICU back in 1958. And it's a really telling quote. He says, we experienced the frustration of trying to provide respirator care to an unconscious patient in various locations of the hospital without the help of trained inhalation therapists and specially trained nurses. And to me, what he's saying is that the ICU itself is a teamwork or intervention, just establishing the ICU. The whole point of it is to bring the team together. So surely there must be evidence that, um, that the team uh, has an impact. So, so then why such disappointing results? Why have empirical studies not borne this out? So one possibility is that there's just not a relationship. It doesn't matter how good the team works. And I sort of reject that. I don't believe that it's true. Another idea is that we're just measuring teamwork wrong. We're using the wrong constructs, meaning that we're, we're thinking very broadly about collaboration. Um, but Teamwork is maybe a lot more nuanced and complicated than that. Another thing is that we're looking at the wrong unit of analysis. All the studies that we've done in the past have looked at the entire ICU and then measured teamwork in that, among that group, and then looked at all the patients over the course of the year and measured outcomes in that group. But those of us who work in the ICU sort of know it's not really a the ICU isn't the team, right? It's really the group of people on that day that are the team. And we've never really looked at that. And then the other thing is that the interventions that support collaboration or only support collaboration are potentially pretty weak. So thinking about this here, I was getting pretty depressed and I was also sort of approaching middle-aged. And I was also getting this grant that, that Rob mentioned, and there's, there's no, there's no non-jerky way to describe this grant when you ask about it. It's, it's an outstanding investigator award. Like, like pompous jerk is in the name, but what it is, is you, you essentially turn in all your R01s to the NIH and in return, they give you this grant that gives you six to seven years of unrestricted funding. And there's no specific aims. They basically said, we pre trust you. We believe in you just go to town and show us something good. And, and so I got this grant right at the time where I'm kind of pretty frustrated and kind of wondering, well, what else can I do that will have an impact? Um, and the next immediate next step, as it often is, is a sabbatical. And I show Randy here because this was his idea. And I, and I vividly remember the day that we were on the subway in Brussels after a night trip and we were taking the subway and I actually had to convince him to take the subway. He wanted to take a taxi cab, but I said it was more um, uh, environmentally friendly to take public transportation. I think he was just exhausted and wanting to get to the hotel. But I was expressing to Randy that how sort of frustrated I am and how I feel like I'm at a bit of a crossroads. And he said, uh, take a sabbatical. And I thought, yeah, I should take a sabbatical. Now, of course, Randy took his sabbatical in Paris, which is 10 hours from Seattle and a really nice place. But my spouse is a practicing clinician. She's a pediatric emergency care provider. She can't take a year off. We had two kids at the time. So I didn't go to Paris. What I did was go to Carnegie Mellon University, which is not 10 hours away. Um, it's really close to University of Pittsburgh. In fact, Google Maps um, suggests that you just walk it. Uh, instead of taking a flight. They helpfully offer two routes though. One, you can shave two minutes off the walk. Um, but even though it's just across town, it was light years away for me. And I was really able to take six months and shut off my email and ignore my research staff and just think. And that's why the advice that Randy gave me was just so unbelievably priceless. And not only was I able to just think at Carnegie Mellon, by it, I embedded myself in a really special group, and that is the um, Tepper School of Business at CMU. And in, in this group studied this thing called organizational behavior and theory, the study of human behavior within the organization. The founder of this group was a guy named Herb Simon, 
Herb was a legend in the 1950s. He actually won the Nobel Prize for his work. What he did was essentially ask, why do we even have organizations? And he came up with the notion of bounded rationality, the notion that human beings are not actually rational decision makers. It's something we take for granted now, particularly in the era of Kahneman and Tversky and thinking fast and slow. But back then, this was well before Kahneman and Tversky. The assumption was that if a human was given enough time and enough information, he or she would come to the right decision. And of course, that was ridiculous. But nobody realized that was ridiculous until Herb Simon came up with the idea. But now we have all the heirs to Herb Simon. And I just show a couple people, Linda, um, who I worked with um, and continue to work with, and we'll show you some of the work we do together, who studied um, organizational learning and how teams create and retain knowledge. Lori Weingard studies conflict and team relations. Anita Woolley studies um, collective intelligence and how the team is actually smarter than the sum of its parts. And spending time with this group was just really transformative for me. One thing they, they got me to think about was that teamwork is a very complicated construct and it's much more complicated than we were thinking about when we were doing these past studies. You know, we've been thinking about collaboration like these people here on the left, you know, they're a team, they're working together, they're trying to achieve a common goal, but they're, they're not quite a healthcare team or, or, or at least analogous to a healthcare team. I'm not 100% sure what they're assembling there. But suffice it to say, that's not what we think of. What we think about are these people on the right. You know, they're trying to solve a puzzle. They're looking at this jet engine from different directions. It's much more dynamic and there's much more interdependence in what they're doing. And it was really helpful for me to think about teamwork in that way. They also pushed me to think about what makes ICU teams unique. Not all teams are created equal, right? What in the ICU teams are ad hoc, we throw them together. Uh, they also have very low temporal stability, meaning the team today is not the team tomorrow. And even for a same patient, right? A patient, you know, two patients have different teams because a nurse only has two patients. The hierarchies are very complex. They exist, but they're kind of dynamic. The task is very complex and the task is also urgent. And we use this hierarchy to specify this um, and really helped me to think that the way to understand teams is not just to think of them as a team, but think of them as a very specific team that has these very specific attributes. Okay, so that's the background. That's where I was a little frustrated, but supercharged about this sabbatical and meeting some incredibly smart people who don't work in healthcare, who um, had not set foot in a hospital unless it was for their own you know, personal reasons to think about how can we take the lessons from organizational behavior and theory and focus them on critical care. So now I'm gonna show you some new work that we've just come out with and uh, can maybe get your feedback on it. So study one. So for the first study, I wanted to focus on this thing called team learning behaviors. These were outlined by uh, Amy Edmondson. She's at Harvard. Her, her big thing and the thing that I really wanted to focus on in my first study was this notion of psychological safety which is the fourth line there. This is the belief that the team is safe for interpersonal risk-taking. And I think this resonates with us a lot, right? When I'm on rounds, um, you know, I might wanna prescribe a certain antibiotic, but the clinical pharmacist perhaps has scrolled through the chart and seen past admissions and knows that the patient had grown a bug that was resistant to that antibiotic. Um, and now he or she has a tough decision to make, right? You know, can this person raise their hand in the middle of rounds with seven or eight people there, residents and fellows, and say, um, Jeremy, you're, you're a moron, you're wrong. Maybe they wouldn't say you're a moron, or maybe they would if, if they were feeling particularly psychologically safe. But, you know, what does it take to get that person to speak up? Um, because that's what's going to improve outcome for this patient. And then the flip side of psychological safety is this notion of leader inclusiveness, right? What do I do as a leader to invite the, the space for that person to speak up? Do I pause? Do I solicit contributions? Do I say, does anyone else have any ideas? Do I show uncertainty as a shine of strength and saying, I'm not 100% sure what to do. Here's what I might wanna do, but I would really love to hear your ideas. Those are the things that I hypothesized along with my colleagues at CMU were potentially influential. Um, psych safety um, has been a contract around a lot, and I do urge you to read this really neat piece in the New England Journal from Lisa Rosenbaum, um, where she wrote at length about what psychological safety means and how it, useful it is in healthcare. But even here, she acknowledges the lack of empiric work um, in this area. So we wanted to study it. Here was our conceptual model. We thought psych safety influenced performance. We thought leader inclusiveness 
could influence psych safety. And we also were interested in things like leader familiarity. How, how much did everyone know the attending? Uh, role clarity, does everyone feel really certain in their job? And then how busy were they on that day, right? Because you, know, you can think on a busy day, I might be less likely to, to perform all these behaviors and therefore um, it could negatively affect say, safety. Here's our study, it was just published in Annals of ATS. So these are hot, hot data. Uh, Matt Diabes is the first author. He's a PhD student at CMU. Um, you can also see Lori Weingart is there and some of our other colleagues. Uh, we surveyed um, 12 ICUs and six hospitals. And the other innovation here was that we focused on the rounding team. So instead of round, you know, surveying everyone in the ICU, we basically just swooped in right beginning of rounds and say, you know, please complete this survey. And at the end of rounds, we swooped in again and we gave them, I think, till 5 p.m. that day because we were going to be there the next day. And we surveyed them each over a two week period. We pulled out all the stops, man. And this was like the hardest research I've ever done because we were, we gave them money, we gave them coffee cards. We did everything we could to get uh, a high response rate. Response rate frequently kills a lot of this type of research, right? There's an old saying in organization and management that the best way to improve morale is to fire all the unhappy people. And I, um, I often think that, you know, the best way to get the wrong answer in an organizational survey is to only survey, you know, the happy people. And so we, it's very hard to get the, the people who are miserable and pissed off to complete a survey, or sometimes those are the only people who complete the survey is if they're miserable and pissed off. So we kind of failed, which was a huge bummer, but we were able to do some stuff on the back end where we analyzed only teams that had a decent response rate. And we ended up with 89 total rounding teams and 300 providers. Um, here's the main results slide, I, and I'm not gonna get into all the details, but suffice it to say, we asked them at the end of the day, how well did the team work? And all our, for the most part, all our hypotheses were confirmed. So psych safety was very influential, strongly positive. Um, leader inclusiveness was very influential, strongly positive. And as you might expect, job strain was negative. The busier they were, the worse they functioned. It was reassuring. We felt that leader familiarity was actually not associated because that's hard to improve, right? Like I see you attending switch day to day and week to week, and we can't fix that. So I liked to see the team function was kind of robust to how well the team knew this particular attending. And then uh, these aren't the exact uh, mediation analyses, but suffice it to say, the leader inclusiveness is uh, in part mediated by psych safety. And you can actually see that the risk estimate goes down a little bit in the multivariate model. And what that means is leader inclusiveness is important, but on its own, but one of the ways it's important is that inclusive leaders create psychological safety. So we also took the added step in the study and said on that day, how good was the team, not in terms of their own perception, but quite literally. And we looked at two evidence-based practices, uh, lung protective ventilation in patients with ARDS. This is the idea that we should ventilate with the baby lung um, so as not to overextend the lung and cause um, biological trauma. And then we asked about daily um, interruption of sedation and spontaneous breathing trials. How often did we sort of do a best evidence-based practice for getting patients off the ventilators? And this is, this is depressing, just a warning. Okay, so we didn't find a result here and, and I was really bummed. You can see that we didn't get a great distribution of psych safety. So for the most part, along the five point scale, people felt, felt pretty safe. Um, for SBTs, we didn't great, get a great distribution of performance. For the most part, ICUs were pretty good. There's also some precision here because sometimes there were only like one or two patients who were eligible for lung protective ventilation, which is why you see a lot of you know, people at 100% and 50% um, compliance. But we didn't see a result, in at least in the adjusted analysis, which was a little bit frustrating. Um, but I'm still cautiously optimistic about this, and we're not done studying psych safety. I think based on this study, we were able to conclude that psych safety and leader inclusiveness almost certainly play some important role, at least in perceived team function. We didn't find evidence that it influences care processes, but in this context, right, in the context of poor response rate, 
um, because 40% is not that good. And in the context of some pretty high performing ICUs where people generally felt safe. And maybe if we surveyed ICUs outside a large academic medical center, we might get a different result. And then the other conclusion was I need to stop doing survey research because it's a huge pain in the butt and never ever do it for any reason. Okay, that's study one. Now, study two, we'll time check. Ooh, we're doing good. Okay. Study two is about transactive memory. That's Linda, Linda Argoti. She is a, um, she's a genius. I don't know what else to say about Linda. She literally wrote the book on organization, um, organizational learning. That's the name of the book, organizational learning. Um, and her main thing is this notion of transactive memory, which is the process by which groups collectively encode, store, and retrieve knowledge. It's colloquially known as who knows what. So the copier is broken. I can't fix the copier, but I know Steve is really good at fixing copiers. So I know to go to him and he can fix the copier. And through these domains of specialization, coordination, and credibility, right? Steve is the specialist in the copier. He and I can coordinate and I trust Steve, right? To know that he's good and he's not going to, you know, break the copier worse, I guess. Um, teams can uh, encode and then store that knowledge. It's particularly important for ad hoc teams with low temporal stability because it makes them robust to turnover, right? If a respiratory therapist is there and I know and trust that respiratory therapist that they're, when I say, can you do an SBT, a spontaneous breathing trial, and they're going to do it, that's transactive memory. But the transactive memory is stronger when the next respiratory therapist I also have that same relationship with, right? And I know that we're robust to different respiratory therapists. This makes teams robust to turnover. Organizations that have strong transactive memory can handle it when, when there's a lot of turnover. So I was like, okay, I wanna study transactive memory, but I also don't wanna do another survey because that's, that was how Linda wanted to measure transactive memory. And we just got done with the previous survey. And I'm like, I'm not doing that. So we looked for a reason. Oh, here's our conceptual model. It's way simpler than the last conceptual model. It's, we, we think transactive memory impacts team performance. Okay, so where are we gonna study transactive memory? So Linda and I put our noodles together and we came up with trauma resuscitation. So like ICU teams, trauma teams are ad hoc. There's low temporal stability. They have a very complex hierarchy. They have task complexity and task urgency. So we thought there's a lot of similarities here between trauma teams and ICU teams. And bonus, this is the ICU bay at UPMC Presbyterian uh, Medical Center, our sort of mothership hospital here in Pittsburgh. And this guy is a camera. And this is a quality assurance camera. And there's actually three of them in the room. And so every time someone walks in the room, they're actually motion detected. This camera goes off and every trauma is audio and video recorded. And uh, that's for QI purposes. So the trauma service reviews the trauma resuscitations to sort of figure out what they can do better. And we had a very, very narrow window before they destroy those where we could repurpose them for research. So here's what we did. We took 120 of the trauma resuscitations and we did a power calculation to arrive at that number that I won't get into. And we watched them. And we coded transactive memory behaviors when we observed them. And I'll describe that in the next slide. So there is a photo of Linda with two grad students. Linda did not actually do any coding, but she pulled two PhD students, super awesome source of cheap labor, by the way, um, to watch these procedures. We had to train them very intently and actually the method by which we train them has a very valuable Seattle connection because it was Matthew Rosengart that some of you will remember, um, who's also the spouse of Janet Lee that many of you will remember, that is our co-investigator on this study who trained our PhD students to know what they were looking at because these are just you know, PhD students. We only reviewed the first 10 minutes and we only reviewed traumas that were longer than 10 minutes. So if the patient died or otherwise experienced an outcome during the video review, we didn't include those. And that was so we didn't you know, impact our reviewers. So they were blinded to outcomes. And then our outcomes themselves were clinical outcomes. The mortality is really low. And for 120 traumas, we weren't gonna see a mortality difference, but we felt that the stronger the resuscitation, you know, the better the ICU length of stay and the better the hospital length of stay. I'm not gonna show you the whole instrument by which we we coded the traumas, but here was just one example. I think we did this along 10 domains, 
but a typical STEM would be the extent to which the team members understood which tax they were supposed to perform. And then the raters rated this on a scale of negative three to three. If the team members did really good, you might say they understood their responsibility and tasks were neither duplicated nor neglected or versus members seem confused about their responsibilities. Some tasks were duplicated where others were neglected. And about 10 different questions, we were able to sort of get at transactive memory. An example of this in a trauma resuscitation, one that I was watching when we were doing this was um, a, um, a resident was setting up to put a chest tube in and you know, asks for uh, lidocaine to numb the chest and nobody does anything. And then, uh, she asks again, and still nobody does anything. And finally, she screams for the lidocaine. And a nurse, a junior nurse, who does not know where the lidocaine is, then starts looking for it. She got the lidocaine, but that was like a minute later. And a minute is a long time if you have attention to the thorax. So, you know, you can contrast that to, you know, a resident who's setting up for a chest tube and a nurse says, oh, I, I know this resident. I think this they're putting in a chest tube and I bet they're going to ask for some lidocaine. And so I'm going to go get the lidocaine right now and be ready for that purpose. That would be a team that has a lot of transactive memory. So what did we find? The two raters were super highly correlated, which was fantastic. Even though they, they were blinded to each other, they almost got identical results. And we also got much nicer spread than for psych safety. Um, there was not enough of a right tail. I was hoping for more of a right tail, but we got what we got. Um, you get what you get and you don't get upset, as they say. So um, it was enough to do the study. And then this study was strongly positive. So we controlled for how sick the patient was. We also controlled for whether the trauma attending was in the room. Um, we also controlled for how many people were in the room. I didn't put that there. And whether it was a nighttime trauma. And we found that more transactive memory was strongly correlated, correlated with um, ICU length of stay and hospital length of stay. So that was very, very, very exciting. Interim conclusion, TMS is cool and it's important. Okay, let's transition. So my last five minutes, um, and I think we should have some time for Q&A, although Q&A over Zoom is usually always pretty terrible, but we might have some time for it. Um, I'm gonna tell you what's next. And it's a clinical trial and it's really exciting for me for a couple of reasons. One is I hope, even though we're just now launching it, so I have no data to report, I hope that just telling you about the clinical trial will sort of show to you how these two elements of research came together in an intervention, how our lessons from psych safety and our lessons from transactive memory yielded an intervention that we're gonna test in a clinical trial. And it's also cool because now I'm finally a clinical trialist after 20 years. I, li I like to joke, I don't do clinical trials, but I like to criticize clinical trials. And people who do clinical trials never found that joke funny. <laughs> And now I know why, because boy, do they hate people like me who come at the end of their trial and tell them how terrible their design was after, you know, they've done it. And uh, man, it is hard designing a clinical trial. So, so come with me on this journey. Okay. So we thought about this and we said, well, a successful teamwork intervention then is not just going to make collaborators, right? It's not something vague as collaboration. It's about dynamic interdependence. It would strengthen transactive memory create a scenario that I know what you know, and I know that you know that I know that you know it, that's transactive memory. It would support psych safety and empower people to speak up. And it would not threaten role identity, which was also important in our study. People want to, want to value themselves as in their individual roles. Respiratory therapists care about being respiratory therapists. So Linda and I came up with this. It was not a new concept. It's interprofessional education. But it is a concept that has not been studied at all. And that was really highlighted in this Institute of Medicine report that is now about six years old. It makes such intuitive sense, right? We train in silos. Respiratory therapists go to respiratory therapy school. Nurses go to nursing school. Physicians go to medical school. And then we get thrown into the practice environment and are expected to behave as a team. Even CME is siloed, right? I get CME at Grand Rounds with physicians and nurses get CME another way and we're not getting the same CME. This siloed training creates what, what you might call non-overlapping mental models and that we just think about problems differently. And if I know what you know, I might be more likely to speak up and create um, this thing called psychological safety. I really wanted to double down on this idea of the shared mental model because other places in healthcare, um, people believe conceptually that it's valuable, right? 
Uh, the, these are studies from the nursing literature and the cancer literature, but these are both conceptual pieces. There's actually shockingly little empirical research on interprofessional education and its role in creating a shared mental model and delivering effective team-based care, but very, very provocative, provocative uh, conceptual work. I also like it because it hits all the barriers, right? This is a really classic paper from JAMA, um, Michael Cabana, uh, a pediatrician did this, but while he was an RWJ scholar, I think at UCSF, where he said the main barriers to evidence-based practice are knowledge, attitudes, and behavior, right? I don't know about the evidence-based practice, that's knowledge. I know about it, but I don't agree with it. That's attitudes. I know about it and I agree with it. I want to give lung protective ventilation and I think it's a good idea, but it's just too hard. That's behavior. And the hypothesis is that interprofessional education hits all of these different domains in a really unique way. And then this came along. This is an RFA from the NHLBI. They want exactly this hybrid effectiveness implementation trials for heart, lung, blood, and sleep diseases. What a great RFA. Thank you, NHLBI. Um, Tim Gerard is my main co-investigator on this. He is a clinical trialist, unlike me, and he helped us figure out what the intervention that we wanted to study is. We ended up picking this, preventive post-extubation non-invasive ventilation. This is the idea that for high-risk patients, right when you extubate them, take them away with a mechanical ventilator, you should add non-invasive ventilation for about six hours. And it's really pretty effective um, and strongly endorsed in clinical practice guidelines. There's the ATS guideline of which Tim Gerard is an author. And they recommended this with a strong recommendation and moderate certainty in the evidence. So there's pretty good data to suggest that this thing helps patients. It's also a team-based intervention, right? It's, I need a willing respiratory therapist and a really good nurse and a really um, good um, uh, clinician physician to do this. There's a strong implementation gap, meaning that we're not doing it. You know, almost nobody is getting this. And so it really felt ripe. Um, I named our trial. I, I came up with this fancy nickname, acronym, Maximizing Extubation Outcome Through Educational and Organizational Research, or Meteor. And then we have this cool logo. And then somebody helpfully pointed out to me, wait, isn't a meteor something that comes crashing down to earth in a fiery disaster? And then I was like, yeah, maybe should not have named our trial after that, but it's still a pretty slick acronym. So we're sticking with it. <laughs> um, we launched it last month. We, we have about six months to get off the ground. It's a five-year trial, 30 centers, cluster man to my step wedge. The, um, we're doing a combination of classroom education and so-called just-in-time education that I didn't talk about, but basically education right at the moment of need, which is meant to make, make education a little more sticky. Um, and is um, the comparator groups are traditional siloed uh, online CME and nothing, just like a brochure. And uh, we're gonna tell you that this is a good idea. We're looking at a variety of implementation outcomes, like how well did we do this thing? We're doing some clinical outcomes, like did we improve patient care, like, like mortality and reintubation rates? And then we're also coming in on the back end and doing a very rich uh, qualitative uh, evaluation to understand, you know, heterogeneity of treatment effects, and is it possible that this worked in some ICUs and not others? Um, this slide it just gives you the reference if you want to hear a lot about our theory. We, we really wanted to engage clinicians in designing our interventions, so we did a lot of interviews, focus groups, um, to arrive at where we got. The other purpose of this slide is just to say that it takes a village um, and. These people are all instrumental. Kim Rack is a medical anthropologist who's simply a genius. Um, Jennifer Seaman is a nurse. Uh, Dean Hess is a respiratory therapist. Uh, Linda Argodi, you know. Um, where is she? Oh, Jennifer Russell is a specialist in adult education. Barbara Barnes is a specialist in uh, uh, continuing medical education. So we really have a fantastic team here. This was just published in ATS Scholar, awesome journal, by the way. Um, and then here's the conceptual model. We think that teamwork is gonna by itself potentially make a better team. But we also think interprofessional education will strengthen teamwork and strengthen outcomes. And then we're also powered, and this was really exciting, to test the moderation hypothesis that actually ICUs that have good TMS and good psych safety might respond to the intervention better. So you'll have to invite me back in five years, not for the Butler lecture, but for a different lecture to get the results of this paper, or maybe you could just read them in the peer reviewed literature um, too. So that's it. To sum up, 
um, 30 years of research has failed to yield actionable targets for improving teamwork. And I hope that that's because we were just thinking about it wrong, that by leveraging psychological safety and transactive memory via interprofessional education, we can close the implementation gap in the ICU and improve outcomes. Stay tuned for results. And then summary continued is thank you for indulging me as I took a little bit of a trip down memory lane and thank you for training me. I can't say this enough times, but everything I have is really due to the amazing experience I had in Seattle and all the wonderful faculty and all my co-fellows um, helped me get to this point. So thank you very much for that. Uh, with that, I will end and uh, thanks again. Thank you so much, Dr. Khan. That was a great talk, a great overview. Um, there are actually several questions in our uh, chat, so I'm just going to try to collect some of them and um, please feel free, uh, everyone in the audience, to add more as we go along. Uh, I think there were a couple of questions that came in on the earlier side of your talk that I think were um, getting at this concept that you were kind of connecting the, the quality of patient care with the teamwork. And I think there were questions about uh, kind of challenging that notion of, of wondering you know, do we feel like it's maybe a good thing that teamwork doesn't seem to have, may not have connections because that may mean that the system has so many safeguards in place. Um, and just kind of curious your thoughts on that or what, you know, how you might uh, feel that teamwork could be yeah, so playing a role there. Excellent point. And in fact, a lot of what I, you know, when I used to talk about my research, I would say that most of what I'm doing is trying to make the quality of care robust to a bad physician and by extension, a bad team, right? That's sort of the purpose of protocols. That's sort of the purpose of, you know, interprofessional care. But, and, and so I think, yes, a really high functioning ICU might be able to do well with a team, but I suspect that there's more juice for the squeeze, right? In my opinion, particularly with new innovations, right? Particularly with how, do, how rapidly can we adopt a new treatment? Um, one that is not necessarily um, supported by 20 years of evidence. Um, so that would be my, the first way I would reply to that question is like, I think that that, that is good, necessary, but not sufficient to have those structures in place. The other point I make is that I hope that the evidence doesn't bear that out, by which I mean, we're still pretty terrible at providing evidence-based practice. I, I took a slide out for time, but one of the slides I show in talks like this is um, some data from the Lung Safe study, which was published just two years ago in JAMA. And they looked internationally at the use of lung protective ventilation, which is arguably the most evidence-based therapy in our field. Like you'd be hard pressed to find something more solidly supported by evidence. And only about 40% of patients with severe ARDS were getting lung protective ventilation. And these were ICUs, not run in the mill ICUs. These were ICUs that agreed to participate in a multinational registry of quality. And so I'm thinking, man, if after 20, 30 years of lung protective ventilation data and all those structures, there's not more juice for the squeeze, I'd be surprised and a little disappointed. But, but nonetheless, that point is really good and points well taken. Thank you. I, I think there was another question that came in about um, one of your studies, I think the second study focusing on psychological safety and transactive memory. Uh, and I think something that probably everyone on this call is familiar with is the high turnover of a lot of our teams. And so um, the question is really, how, how do we think about um, strategies to improve these uh, concepts in a system where inherently the RTs and the nurses turn over every couple of days, the residents are on and off service so often, and, and how to really instill this in a place, especially like you know, academic medicine, where we have people coming through so often. Yeah, you guys are too smart. So, so the first thing, two, two points I want to make. One is, so when I first presented, so when I first got to CMU for my sabbatical, they had me lecture at their sort of main research lecture, and they were aghast. And one of the many things they were aghast at is, surely you do crew management, right? Which is what the airlines do, which is, you know, schedule the teams to be the same team day in and day out. Like, why, why do you have just a random nurse show up? You should have, you should intelligently pair people. And it was truly shocking to them that we don't do this. My response was, well, look, sometimes it's hard enough just to get a warm body in the ICU, let alone a very specific nurse with a team. Um, so that's the first point is I think my hope is, my goal is to create teams that are robust to that turnover, right? And that to me is what transactive memory is about. And it's also what psych safety is about, which is that even though I don't know this respiratory therapist, I trust them and I believe that they can speak up and tell me that I'm doing something wrong. Or they can say, hey, Jeremy, what about non-invasive ventilation after 
after we extubate this patient, you know, you, you believe this data, right? And I won't be threatened. I'll say, oh, thank you for reminding me. You know, that's a good point. But there's a whole another part of my research that I didn't show you, which is sort of a get, getting at just that. And what we're doing here is um, we're using, um, you know, everything thus far about staffing has just been about what your training is. And it's not really been about the individual person. So we're using metadata from the EHR because every time I open a patient's chart, I leave a little e signature there to identify who was the physician, who was the nurse, who was the resident, which students were there and actually identify them as human beings. And then we can look at things like how the social networks evolve over time and how that affects. So we, so that's another part of our research. And I think both of those together are gonna to be the answer. We want to we want to intelligently design teams, but when we and we will when we can, and hopefully my research will inform that. But we also want to um, make teams robust to the to the scenario where we can't intelligently design them. Uh, another question is asking: um, Can you speak to the role of APPs in the ICU in terms of interprofessional education and practice? Yeah. So. I super can because there are educators, believe it or not. So we were like, well, who's going to be the person who gets up at the front of the lecture room and does the teaching? But the problem is nurses want to learn from nurses and physicians want to learn from physicians. And so we were like, well, who's going to, who's going to um, speak to all the groups? And our answer was APPs. So we think that APPs are actually a hugely influential lib, both nurse, nurse practitioners and physician's assistants, and they are our primary educators. Now, what I didn't show you also is we had a big pilot. Um, this U01 that we just got was the second U01 in a series. The first U01 was just to pilot our interventions. One thing we found during the pilot, and this is kind of sad, so you know, get depressed, is it's really hard to get physicians to interprofessional education. Like they just didn't want to show up. And so we felt that the main way to get them to show up was to feed their egos and so, and feed their bellies, but mostly their egos. And so we make them the educators too. So now we have these partner educator teams, physicians and APPs. The APPs, we want their expertise and we want them to be able to speak to everyone. For physicians, we want to teach them but we're teaching them by sort of with a wink and a nudge because we're telling them how smart they are. They're gonna be the educators too. And they have to then learn that learned in order to teach. And so that's our little trick, but all that to say instrumental role in both the healthcare team. And we've shown that empirically and in this process of interprofessional education. And then going back to uh, the transactive memory that you were talking about, um, this question is uh, asking, what are your thoughts about the, how ambiguity or inconsistency of um, the use of electronic health records for communication uh, versus closed loop verbal communication? How does, how do those, um, the distinction between those two, how do they impact uh, transactive memory and how the team functions? Yeah, I don't think we know the answer to that. The EHR is one of these things in this, in this domain and in many domains, it's sort of conceptually should help and probably hurt, right? And we certainly know this in the quality of the notes, the clinical notes that we read each day, like an EHR note is really nothing like a handwritten note. 75% you know, of it is stuff that was carried over from the previous day and is not at all relevant. And it takes me a long time to tease in versus getting people in the same room together. Um, so I think the EHR is probably a barrier to this process overall. The other thing I don't like about the EHR, and this is not related to the questions or the, the, the person's topic is, because it's so instrumental, it's a part of rounds, right? And so when I'm on rounds now in the ICU, I'm just staring at a bunch of computer screens. I don't actually see the patients, the, the faces of the people. Also, I don't see the patient because we can't wheel these computers into the patient's room. So it's, they're made care patient, less patient-centered in a lot of ways. But ultimately, I think that hopefully, um, I do think in-person communication and moving away from sort of um, asymmetrical, asynchronous communication is going to help. I don't know how to target it, though. I feel, I feel like I have to sort of think a little bit harder to figure out how to make make that issue a, more of a lever. And certainly we don't, we're not focused on communication in this, in our intervention. We're just focused on um, this idea of engendering transactive memory. We're not trying to make people better communicators simply because I don't think that that's specific enough to improve outcomes in the ICU. 
I know we're getting close to time, but I, I will just ask one more question um, before we before we end. Uh, this is a, a comment just saying, this is a great example of how research and education intersect. And just looking for any insights or thoughts you have about how to improve and better develop education scientists in the ICU space. Yeah, fantastic question. Um, because people, particularly in their career trajectory, they often feel it's an either or, right? Oh, I'm gonna be a clinician educator or I'm gonna be a clinician scientist. And I'm definitely pushing back against that dichotomy and saying that you can be both. Um, and frankly, I think implementation science is the hook, right? Because if you write a grant to the NIH and they say, and you say, we're gonna study education, they're gonna be like, well, that's not us, we're clinical outcomes and health and basic science. But if you say, we're trying to study translation of evidence into practice and part and parcel to that is teaching people, right? Then that gets people excited. Um, and so I do think that when you frame it like that, the NIH is increasingly interested. The, the other two points I'd make are, there are foundations that are specifically interested in this, specifically the Macy Foundation, um, which is run by Holly Humphrey, who actually coincidentally was my residency director at University of Chicago and an internal medicine um, specialist. She's fantastic. And they fund um, essentially K awards, career development awards for educators to, do, to study innovation in education. Um, because without that, we're just going to lose. We're just going to lose um, a key lever to improve quality if we don't if we don't make education better, right? And I can tell you, in you know, as part of this U01 mechanism, we go to the NIH a lot and present work, and we frequently say, "What well, we know, education is not powerful, Jeremy. Like we know that it fails. Why are you trying to study it?" and push back on just the notion of even trying to improve medical education as a lever for translating evidence into practice. And my response is, it fails now because bad education fails, right? We're doing it wrong. And not only are we doing it wrong and doing it poorly, but we're doing it a lot. Meaning every single, you know, everything that Randy has studied has had an education element to it. And so hopefully if we learn how to make education better, it will be a better piece of the puzzle for broader implementation work. And if we're gonna be doing it, which we are, why, aren't, why shouldn't we make it as good as possible? And that I think is a compelling narrative for a career trajectory. And hopefully the, the clinician educators in the room will think, man, I can be a scientist too. It's not, it's, not, um, it's not either or, it's both, it's both. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Khan. I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. I, I know it's just after one o'clock, but uh, thank you again for uh, a great talk, a great overview, really great questions as well. So thank you all of our audience members for participating. And I think uh, we will post the uh, PDF of the Butler Lecture uh, awardees along with the link for this uh, for the, on the Grand Rounds website. Oh, thank, thank you so you much, again. you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. No, Jeremy, thank you so much for a fantastic talk. The, you said the Q&A at the end of Zoom is not great. You should just see the line of questions. They're coming from all over the United States as well, too. So uh, all right. really I'm going to read the chat. Talk. And anyone can email me with more questions. And I love talking about this stuff. I could talk about it forever. Um, well, that, so. that passion is very clear, which is fantastic. <laughs> Thanks again for having yeah. me. Yeah, thank you, Jeremy.